Steven is in his final year of university, and he's about to graduate from the University of Toronto with a double major in computer science and econ, and a minor in Buddhism, psychology, and mental health. But he still has no idea what he wants to be when he grows up, and supposedly he's already grown up. And he's been like this his entire life, really indecisive, especially about what he wants to be. When he was 7, he wanted to be a dog trainer. When he was 13, he wanted to be a firefighter. When he was 17, he wanted to be a software engineer. And how did he end up with a double major in computer science and econ, and a minor in Buddhism, psychology, and mental health? Well, well, it's because he couldn't figure out what he wanted to study. So he flip-flopped around different majors, different minors until his third year of university when he realized that he really needed to graduate. Since he already took a couple courses in computer science and a couple courses in econ, he felt like having a computer science and econ degree would be helpful in getting a good career. And a very interesting minor? Well, it's because he just took a lot of psychology, philosophy, and different types of courses and somehow without realizing completed a minor in Buddhism, psychology, and mental health. But in any case, he's about to graduate now and allegedly he's supposed to have settled down now, chosen a career, and ready to get his first job but he just can't choose because he's interested in everything and tbh not particularly good or talented at anything okay so what's he supposed to do by the way just so you know buddhism psychology and mental health is in fact an actual minor at the university of toronto i went to that school the renaissance man a model of versatility well Aren't you the renaissance man? He is a renaissance man. Did you know that the idea of a single career hasn't always been a thing? The renaissance was a prolific period of European culture, artistic, political, and economic rebirth following the middle ages. People during that time are encouraged to learn about lots of different things, and they were actually praised for being multidisciplinary. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, was considered the ideal renaissance man, largely because of how interdisciplinary he was. He had incredible talent in art, painting masterpieces like The Last Supper, the Vitruvian Man, and of course, the Mona Lisa. But he was also an inventor and made significant contributions in engineering and math. He designed workable precursors to a diving suit, a robot, and a tank. And this was centuries before it could become a reality. He was also a scientist that designed the first self-propelled machine and described the process as governing friction. People like da Vinci, someone that embodies the trait of having so many different passions, lots of different interests, spanning multiple disciplines, is what we call now a Renaissance soul. Yes! In your face, high school guidance counselor! So your high school counselor sold you a big myth. You were supposed to choose a career at 17, 18 and do that career for the rest of your life. Somehow ignoring, first of all, how are you supposed to know what you even like or don't like? Assuming that like most high school students, you've had essentially zero exposure to the workforce and most careers. For example, I literally thought that the medical field comprised of three different careers, which is being a doctor, a nurse, or a pharmacist. Oh, and also because I grew up in China, you can also be a traditional Chinese doctor. But yeah, that was about it. And somehow we're also supposed to ignore the fact that a large number of jobs didn't even exist 10 years ago. For example, social media manager, influencer, cloud engineer, app engineer, prompt engineer? A study from the World Economic Forum states that 65% of children entering grade school today will end up working jobs that don't even exist yet. The same study also says nearly 25% of jobs are set to be disrupted in the next five years, primarily from key technological changes like AI being a key role, as well as phenomena like climate change. And final point we're supposed to ignore when we're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do when you're 16 or 17 years old is the fact that not only our surroundings, our world, our futures are rapidly changing, we as human beings are also changing. And and that's a really good thing. Like, do you really want to be the same person you were 10 years ago? The biggest myth is that careers are supposed to be static. They're not. People just change, okay? But how did this all come about? Somewhere between the Renaissance and modern day, we became sold on this myth that careers are static and we're somehow supposed to choose our career when we're fresh out of high school. Well, I was really interested in answering this question and to do so, I consulted ChatGPT. Why did education and career development became such that high school counselors tell us we are supposed to choose a single career and stick with it? the rest of our lives. Okay, so this is what ChatGPT has for us. Industrial revolution and economic specialization. So basically, for little Jimmy to be a better cog in the machine, it is better for him to become a predetermined specific kind of cog to make the machine run better. Next up is education system evolution. So to make little Jimmy into a better cog in the machine, the education system starts to cater towards making him into a cog. The modern education system was designed to produce compliant workers suitable for the routines and demands of factories 
factory work. So the next reason is actually a very interesting one, the rise of professionalism. I'm going to save that for a little bit later in the video. But before then, I want to talk about these last three points, economic security, cultural values, and information asymmetry. Economic security was an idea that came about in the 20th century in which job stability became associated with personal stability. For example, if our little Jimmy was part of the baby boomer generation, he would have been incentivized to stay with the same company for his entire life. Obviously very different now. And when it comes to cultural values and information asymmetry, it really just refers to the fact that most of our cultures still have like this idea uh, that being like stable, predictable, and sticking with one career is considered good. And information asymmetry is because you might just not have the ability to know that so many careers are out there where your counselor didn't know at least. Okay, so I do want to return to that earlier point that I skipped, which is the rise of professionalism. This refers to the fact that the complexity and the breadth of knowledge in any given field has increased a lot. For example, if you want to become a neurosurgeon, that could be up to 12 to 15 years of post-secondary school education, as opposed to previously where it was like, become an apprentice and then poke the brain also, and hopefully it works. This is a very interesting point and a very valid point. So I want to acknowledge the fact that it isn't as simple as us just saying, oh, like we shouldn't just choose a single career like the way that our education system asks for and just do random things. It is absolutely true that since the Renaissance, most jobs have become a far more specialized. So how do we reconcile all this? What is the best approach to choose a career in our modern age? That's it. I cannot make this decision. It is too difficult. Introducing the T-shaped person. The vertical bar represents a deep specialization in a specific area. Let me actually explain using Steve Jobs as an example. So for Steve Jobs, his vertical line was in design. He spent a lot of time delving into calligraphy, into typography, into the arts. And his horizontal line, which represents a breadth of knowledge across different disciplines, included technology and business and marketing. Fun fact, Steve Jobs never coded. That was never his vertical, even though he was a CEO of a tech company. But it was precisely because he had that strong vertical in design and the arts. He was able to bring that into other disciplines, including technology, and was able to absolutely disrupt the current status quo where you have like cool functionality, but the designs of things was not user-friendly and it was frankly hideous. So by being a T-shaped person, having that deep design knowledge, and then integrating things in technology, in business and marketing, he was able to come up with products like the iPhone which was absolutely revolutionary. You see, becoming a T-shaped person is a way to reconcile the fact that you do need to specialize in something, but you're also able to have many different interests. It actually becomes an advantage. So now let's actually circle back to our friend, Steven, who's about to graduate, super stressed out, doesn't know what he's supposed to do with his life. So now we're able to offer him a solution and a path forward to become a T-shaped person. But the question is, how do you become a T-shaped person exactly? So the first thing I would tell Steven is to don't stress so much about trying to fit the mold into a single career. This is a myth that has been peddled for many years and is largely a relic of the past. Choose a vertical and build up your vertical first. For you, it's probably going to be econ or computer science because it's something that you already have a major in. Get a job in one of these fields or both of these fields and start building career capital. Career capital is defined as a set of skills, knowledge, reputation, and relationships that you build over time in your professional career. And these are assets that will help you advance your career. It gives you value to society because you have specialized skills that will open up opportunities for you. Like for example, you suddenly might decide that you want to be a software engineer, right? But you don't just get to do whatever it is that you want to do. If you don't know how to code, you have no experience in there. Why would someone hire you as a software engineer? Well, that's why you have to actually build up that career capital that gives you those skills to open up opportunities for you. I do just want to make a point here saying that it doesn't actually matter that much what it is that you choose to have that specialization is that vertical bar of the T-shaped person. It honestly just needs to be something that you're interested in doing and you don't mind spending a significant amount of time delving into that field. So if this is a problem that you have in which you're listing like highest paying jobs in 2023 and you're like, I have to choose one of these jobs because it has a high salary. This is not really the case and this is a whole other video, but I call this the myth of averages. Essentially, you shouldn't be tricked by the average salaries of things because you're not trying to aim for average. If you're good at something, you can always make way more than the average. For example, Steve Jobs Vertical was in design and the arts, including typography and calligraphy. Traditionally, that does not lead to high paying jobs at all. Okay, so in any case, after you get good at that vertical thing, Steven, now you're able to build up that horizontal bar where you can integrate your expertise with many different disciplines. And that is how you become a T-shaped person. You take advantage of your Renaissance soul and transcend what you could do in just a single discipline. Just like how Steve Jobs brought design and the arts into technology. To end this video fittingly with a quote from Steve Jobs, 
jobs. In his famous 2005 commencement speech at Stanford, he said, You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you in the next video or live stream.